A reading from the Gospel of John. Hear what God's Spirit is saying to you. When it was the evening of that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father was sent to me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If we retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my fingers in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not, do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, my Lord, my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and through believing, you may have life in his name. Here ends the reading of words that give us insight into God. May God grant us wisdom and courage for interpretation. Halle, halle, halle. Friends, will you pray with me? Holy One, we give you thanks for your presence in our lives this day. Be with those of us who faithfully believe and those of us who faithfully doubt and know that you are present in the midst of it all. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of each and every one of our hearts be pleasing to you and acceptable in your sight, O God, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Back in 2006, the United Church of Christ released a television ad. Maybe some of you remember this. In the ad, there's this beautiful stone building, and you can hear the organ playing. Nicely dressed people begin to come into the sanctuary and to sit in their pew. Then the camera pans over to this young black single mother who's desperately trying to calm a crying baby and you see this red button and someone pushes it and the pew acts like an ejector seat and it ejects the single mother from the church then the camera pans over to a gay couple same thing ejected from the church then they pan over to someone who is walking with a walker and ejected from the church and then they show a wide shot of the church and you see people popping up out of pews all over the place being ejected from the church then the screen goes black and it says god does not reject people neither do we the united church of christ and then the shot opens back up and you can see a full sanctuary of people including the people who had been rejected and ejected from the church And you hear the catchphrase of the United Church of Christ, no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. Now looking back at that commercial, the visual effects of a church budget from 2006 uh, don't hold up all that well, but the message does. I love the message that God's people 
look and act in all kinds of different ways, and that the church ought to be a place where all God's people come together and where everyone is truly welcome. You know, if you start driving, I bet within five minutes you can find a church that says everyone is welcome, all are welcome here. But that almost always comes with conditions, doesn't it? I mean, you're welcome as long as you look, think, and act exactly the same way as everyone else. But whenever we start to be who we authentically are, a lot of times churches aren't quite so welcoming. They're not quite so willing to let people live into who, who they really are and who they really want to be. And I think that is true across a whole host of different issues, including theology. Yes, sure, it's fine to bring your questions. It's fine to, to bring beliefs. But at the end of the day, you need to come to the prescribed set of beliefs, the beliefs that the church has set out for you. Have any of you ever found yourself in a church like that that wants to tell you exactly what to think and believe? One of the things that I appreciate most about the United Church of Christ and the Christian Church Disciples of Christ generally, and about this congregation in particular, is that we strive to be a place where everyone really is welcome. One of the things that I have missed the most during the pandemic is to hear that joyful chorus at the beginning of worship where we all say, I am welcome here, you are welcome here, we are welcome here. Not just because it's a good way to start worship and to welcome everyone, but because it is a reminder that God welcomes all of us here and that we, as God's people, welcome each other. I particularly love hearing the kids shout that out. They know that, and that's the message they hear from the time they are born here at University Christian Church, is that they are welcome, that they are loved, and that they are accepted as they are, including their theological beliefs. One of the things that you all have gotten to see over the past year, if you've been watching online, is Marcella tell worship and wonder stories. And if you watch those, maybe one of the things you notice is that kids aren't ever told what to believe. They aren't told the theology that they have to have, but instead it is open-ended. So from the time that they are young, they begin learning to think about God for themselves, to bring their own experience. And I love that. You know, I love the story of Thomas that we've heard uh, a few moments ago. I think Thomas kind of gets a bad rap, doubting Thomas. I like Thomas, and I like his story. The story can be found in the Gospel of John, and in it, we get the disciples shortly after Jesus has been resurrected. They're locked tightly in a house together, and they're talking about what they're going to do without Jesus, how they're going to continue to serve, and they're probably wondering if they will meet a similar fate as Jesus. And then here, coming through the walls, is Jesus. Peace be with you, he says, and he shows the wounds on his hands and on his side. And the disciples see, and they believe, and they begin to rejoice. But there's a problem. Thomas is not with them. And so Thomas does not believe and says, I'm not going to believe it unless I see the wounds on his hands and on his side for myself. And so a week later, they are locked once again in that house. And here comes Jesus again. Peace be with you. And he says, Thomas, touch the wounds on my hands and on my side. And Thomas believes, and he is grateful and begins to rejoice. And Jesus said, do you believe because you have seen? Blessed are those who have not seen, yet still believe. This is what scholar Marcus Borg calls a post-Easter story. He said there are two Jesuses that we hear about in the Gospels. We hear about the pre-Easter Jesus 
the Jesus of history that we can talk about, that we can know, and then the post-Easter Jesus, which is the Christ of faith. That which is, is not the Christ of history, but, but the one of faith that, that believers talk about. And I think in this particular story where we get a post-Easter Jesus, the point is clear. The author of the Gospel of John, writing about 60 years after Jesus had been crucified, is writing to encourage his community who had never met Jesus. Saying, look, even the disciples, even the disciples had doubt. And you, community of faith, are blessed because you believe, even though you have not seen. It's a word of hope and encouragement. But it gives Thomas that not-so-coveted title of doubting, doubting Thomas. I have sympathy for Thomas. Maybe it's because I'm from Missouri, the show-me state, and I understand his desire to want to see, to want to see some proof, to want to see some evidence, to want to see exactly what the other disciples got to see, the wounds on Jesus' hands and in his side. You know, I think that we may have a lesson to learn from Thomas, that doubt and questioning are okay and are a natural part of faith. I mean, indeed, if even one of Jesus' disciples who walked with him experienced doubt, then maybe it's just fine for us to experience that as well and to question things as well. I think that it's very significant that we hear this each year on the Sunday after Easter. This reading always comes up in the lectionary, that prescribed set of readings that many churches follow, on the Sunday of after Easter. You know, I was walking last Sunday on Easter morning. I was taking my dog for a walk, and I ran into one of my neighbors who is culturally Jewish and theologically atheist. And she said, Happy Easter, Caleb. I said, Thank you. And she said, This is the day where your people celebrate that one of my people came back from the dead. I said, Well, I, I said, Kind of, yeah. I said, You know, a lot of us uh, understand that maybe a little bit differently. And she said, That's something really weird for a pastor of a church to say on Easter Sunday. I said, well, not really. I said, I only make one promise to my congregation, and that's that I will always be authentic and that I will always tell the truth as I see it based on, on what I have learned. And not to expect anyone to come out to the same position as I do, but in part to let you know that as we explore God and the, the mystery of theology, that it is something that is sacred even when it is ambiguous, even when we don't know exactly what to make of, of the theology that, that we are talking about and, and the theology that we are studying or the theology that we confess, that there is sacredness in questioning and even in doubting. I love Thomas. And perhaps this is an invitation for me to say that Thomases are welcome here at University Christian Church. People who question the power of the Holy Spirit or the divinity of Christ or even the presence or existence of God, that those Thomases are welcome here at University Christian Church. And more than that, whenever you ask hard questions, you don't have to come to a theologically predetermined answer. That no matter what answer you come to, you are still invited and welcome at University Christian Church because that's what a church is supposed to do. A church is supposed to be a community that strives to live out the teachings of Jesus in our lives. We're supposed to be a community that is an ethical voice for the world. We're supposed to be a community to, that embodies what God's reign is like, that place where all are welcomed and all are valued. 
even, or perhaps especially Thomas's. Today's a day, I think, to celebrate Thomas, not to condemn him. So if you are a Thomas, if you are a doubter and a questioner, today is your day. Welcome to University Christian Church. Thanks be to God. Amen.